Greetings, this is uh, Luis Perez. I'm delighted to come before you to once again host in conjunction with the Jewish Federation of Dutchess County and the Institute of Advanced Theology, our wonderful lectures being led by Dr. Bruce Chilton of the Bard College. Dr. Chilton, as we know, is one of the foremost biblical scholars in the world. He covers a lot of territory, uh, talking to us about culture, anthropology, and geography, and spirituality when he presents his lectures. So we're delighted to be uh, looking at the Herods and their dynasty. We're sorry that we're not able to do this live through one of the platforms such as Zoom, but due to the weather and technological difficulties, we were not able to execute a live presentation. But we hope that this recording is um, as meaningful as if we were connected live. So with no further words or further comments, we defer now to Dr. Bruce Chilton. We look forward to our journey together. Thank you for that fine introduction and for your flexibility, Luis, and yours, Karen, for putting together an alternative to Zoom. Every week seems to bring a new technology during the pandemic. I guess that's one of its benefits. Also like to thank our studio audience, which looks, let us say, elite and engaged, if small and uh, we'll try to take full advantage of that. Today, we're branching out to look at a new member of the family of the Herods, and I think it might be a moment to pause in order to understand why it is that there should be any difficulty about which Herod is who. And the reason for that is quite simply that the Herods were a dynasty. We also, in the United States, have certain political dynasties. If I were to say to you Kennedy or Bush, you would, as an American living in this country over the past few decades, have a rather clear understanding of the difference between, let's say, John F. Kennedy and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. You would know the difference even between President H.W. Bush and W. And it's true also, as a member of our studio audience has pointed out, of the Roosevelt family. You have to know which one to know what you're dealing with. There really is a difference between Franklin and Eleanor and their children. Difference between Ted Kennedy and Robert Kennedy. Neil Bush is not the same as Prescott Bush. These are different Bushes, different offices, different times. We get to know that because we live in the country where this has been happening. Rather confusing for people who newly come here or for people who live outside the country. The Gospels are written by people who lived outside the country and in a different time from the specific Herod's concerned. So it's not surprising that there is a jumble of Herod's in the New Testament and also in the Talmud. Because if you're looking back from a long difference, one Herod looks like another, just as one Pharaoh looks like another from a distance. But we all know they are not all the same. Each of them has got a particular character. And we are coming today to the most formative of the Herods from the point of view of the New Testament, although he is not the most important Herod from the point of view of history. From the point of view of history, the most important remains, of course, Herod the Great. But he died in four prior to the Common Era. And indeed, we saw last time we met that it was his son, Archelaus, who by Herod the Great's will was to inherit the throne of Judea alone. But that will also divided up what had been 
a single rain. So for today's presentation, I've had prepared a map, uh, which was originally drawn for me for a book called Studying the New Testament. And you'll be able to see this if you look at this in association with the recording that we'll distribute. And it's here that we see the crucial distinctions between one region and another, and that will prove very important for us because it will also mark the distinction between one Herod and another. So what we're looking at here, the most important part of territorial Israel was Judea, as you can see there in the south. There is Jerusalem over to the east, right on the Dead Sea. You can see Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Immediately to the north, you can see Samaria. And then north of that, you can see Galilee. If you consider then Galilee, and then move to the east again, this is an area today called the Golan or the Golan Heights. Uh, in antiquity, it was called Golanitis. That's why it's called Golan today. It's simply picking up the ancient name. By Herod's will, this formerly intact territory was divided up. So Archelaus got Judea with Samaria, and another son, whose name was Antipas, got Galilee, along with an area to the east side of the River Jordan called Perea. And then Golan went to another son named Philip. So you had Philip, Antipas in Galilee, and then to the south in Judea, Archelaus. We saw last time that Archelaus proved to be a disaster. As a result of his inconsistent policies and unnecessary cruelty, cruelty reflected in the New Testament in the story of the slaughter of the innocents, Archelaus was deposed from power by the emperor Augustus himself. This was a direct imperial incursion. Augustus remained as loyal as he could to the memory of Herod the Great, but Archelaus was impossible. Now, one reason that Archelaus had fallen was that his attempt to be confirmed as king had been disputed by his own brother, Antipas. And these were full brothers. That is, both Archelaus and Antipas were sons of Herod the Great with the same mother, a Samaritan woman whose name was Malthake. So Antipas had long ambition. What he wanted was to be king of the entire territory. He's something of a sideline for our purposes, but I'll also mention another brother, Philip, also a son of Herod the Great, but by a different mother, was bear in mind, Herod the Great had quite a team of wives. And Philip reigned essentially as a client king of Rome with only residual interest in Judaism. We can tell this by some of the most important pieces of evidence we have from this period, namely coins. You can tell how seriously a ruler wants to take his or her Judaism by what's printed on coins. Do they put idolatrous images on the coins? Or do they avoid that? Philip was happy to put his own face on the coin and to put that of the Roman emperor on the coin. Antipas did not. And Antipas, we'll see, walked a tightrope between pleasing the Romans, especially the emperor on the one hand, and permitting himself to pass by the understanding of Judaism on 
the other hand. We'll see how well or ill he did in that task as we go on. But it is important to bear in mind that at every moment where he makes a move, Antipas wishes to see to it that he ultimately inherits this throne. The deposal of Archelaus came, as we saw last time, with the census, with the tax of the year six of the Common Era, and the enormous revolt that took place against the tax, and the coming of the Roman general Varus in order to restore the rule of Rome. I say the rule of Rome, not peace, because as I said, mass persecutions and crucifixions, sometimes thousands at a time, were part of the policy of Varus as he came in to insist upon Roman rule. Archelaus had been such a disaster that the emperor decided there would not any longer be a member of the Herodian family in Judea as ruler. He starts bringing in a Roman officer, a prefect. This is not yet Pontius Pilate. It will be. We're coming up to that. But he put the first one in, in the year six, in order to have Romans ruling on the ground. Now, with the deposition of Archelaus, Antipas continued to try to ingratiate himself to the Emperor Augustus, but it never quite worked out. I suspect myself that Augustus didn't wish to trust someone who had tried to undermine his own brother. And despite the fact that Antipas named cities in, in, in the name of some of Augustus' relatives, nothing would quite take. So he had to be not exactly deeply in grief when Augustus died in the year 14. And a new emperor, Tiberius, comes into play. It's not in the least a coincidence that the most important building project of Herod Antipas in Galilee was the building of a city named Tiberias, named after the emperor. And you can see Tiberias right on the Sea of Galilee on your map, just to the south and somewhat to the east of Magdala. Yes, that's Magdala as in Mary Magdalene. The impact of the building of Tiberias, culturally speaking, in Galilee was quite significant because he built the place, obviously, in honor of the emperor. He also built it to have typical Roman installations. He wanted this to be a real city. So there's an agora, a marketplace. There's a theater. There's a space for Roman worship, all going on in a city in Galilee, when Galilee previously had not had a city. In addition to all that, it turned out during the building work, as foundations were being set in for Tiberius, they were digging on a cemetery a primary source of uncleanness within any understanding of Judaism. A member of our studio audience has just made an unmistakable face showing what the reaction is to the notion of a person being in proximity to death. This is understood to make you unclean. Therefore, the whole project is unclean. Here was a case where you can clearly see the dilemma Antipas faced. He wants to please the emperor. He has not only put in this investment, he has invested his own reputation with the emperor on this. Yet, it clearly is prohibited by the Torah to build a city on a graveyard. So what he does 
is offer people free accommodation, land, and money, if they will please come and settle in his new city. Guess what kind of Jews took up that offer? Not the most pious. On the whole, not the wealthiest. A contemporary historian named Josephus calls them a rabble. And we could easily understand why this might be the case. It took generations, generations, for the city of Tiberias to be accepted within Judaism because it was understood to be a place from which uncleanness was radiating out in Galilee. One of the closest villages to Tiberias was Magdala, a fishing community, which from this time became a service community for Tiberias. Not surprising that Mary Magdalene is referred to as someone who was possessed by multiple unclean spirits, because there's a great deal of uncleanness going on as a result of Tiberius. The commitment, however, has been made by Antipas. He's clearly moving more in the direction of Rome, of Rome right now than in the direction of Judaism, and we can see this in respect of an even more consequential move. And that is during the same period, same period when Tiberius is being founded, Antipas decides he needs a new marriage. He needs a marriage in order to buttress his standing as a member of the royal house of the Herods. And so he begins a relationship with the granddaughter of Herod the Great, whose name is, I'm sorry for this, I don't make them up, Herodias. <laughs> Herodias is Herod the Great's granddaughter. She was the son of Aristobulus, one of the sons whom Herod had killed, who was the child of Mariamne, the Maccabean princess. Remember that Herod the Great had carried the idea, maybe I can take my Idumean line, put it together with the Maccabean priesthood, and make a kind of royal nobility for my house. But then towards the end of his life, Herod the Great and his paranoia turned on many people, including Marianne, whom he killed, and even his two sons by Marianne. But this daughter, Herodias, is there. Antipas thinks, I should marry her, his niece, who was already married. And he, Antipas, was already married to a princess from Nabatea. Nabatea, you can see on the map, too. It's just south of Perea. But Antipas thinks this is a wonderful idea because, after all, Tiberius himself had been required by Augustus to change wives as part of coming into power. Antipas begins to imitate this Roman practice, and it turns into a disaster. The reason for that is that he, Antipas, travels to Rome with Herodias. All seems well. He travels back. His idea is that he's going to get rid of his previous wife, the Nabataean princess, marry Herodias. What could possibly go wrong? Well, this is the Herodian court. And the Herodian court leaks all over the place. You always find out what's going in. There are no secrets. It's like the White House. Everything comes out the day after. So the woman he was already married to ran away home to her father, the king of Nabatea, with the result that Antipas 
and the Nabataeans never got along after that time. And because she managed to escape and return to Nabataea with a very large cavalcade, this was a public repudiation of Antipas. Added to that, there was a major annoyance in the shape of John the Baptist. This is when John the Baptist comes into play as an historical figure. Because John is in the wilderness offering people immersion with clear understanding which operated throughout Judaism within that period and until this period, that immersion in water will permit you to then come up. You are entirely free of the uncleanness that previously afflicted you. For example, if you had contact with a dead body because you did the right thing, preparing someone for burial. How would you acquire cleanness after that? Answer, you wait time and you immerse. There was a huge dispute within the period over what kind of immersion you should have. Should you use a large pool, a small mikvah? John the Baptist had an answer. Naturally collected water in the Judean wilderness. God made that, therefore, it is by definition living water, we should be using that. He acquires many different disciples, including Jesus of Nazareth, who makes his way from Galilee to Judea, where John was. So John is a person particularly interested in the whole issue of cleanness or purity. And he looks at this marriage between Antipas and Herodias, and he says what is obviously the case, that this cannot be correct from the point of view of the Torah. In this period, if you were to attack a marriage of that kind, that amounted to delegitimating the reign itself. You're saying this rule is not, in fact, acceptable. Therefore, Antipas ordered him beheaded. And that actually occurred in one of the fortresses that Antipas had in Perea, a place called Machaerus. And it meant that Antipas was always wary of the memory of John the Baptist and of anyone who might be the disciple of John. So John the Baptist himself is executed by Antipas for being a faithful interpreter of the Torah within Judaism. The reason for the act is that Antipas is moving strongly in a Roman rather than a Judaic direction. But I want to say something in favor of Antipas, and it is that in the same period when he was in Rome, finalizing the plans for the marriage with Herodias, he also appealed to the emperor to bring an end to the attempted policy of excluding Jews from Rome. He argued that although there was a move about in Rome for all foreigners, as they were called, to be removed, Jews should not be put in that definition on the grounds that there had been a long-standing agreement of the recognition between Judaism and Rome. And Antipas succeeded. He's a very interesting character. The fact that he veers toward Rome doesn't mean he rejects Judaism. But he certainly does attempt to redefine it in his attempt to marry his niece. He continues his policy of moving ahead towards the end of inheriting the full reign of Herod the Great. And after the time of the death of John the Baptist in the year 21, as you can see from the other handout, which is the chronology, 
he also takes within his realm another member of the Herodian household. Right now, he is going to be a side figure, but next time we meet, he's going to prove to be one of the pivotal Herodians. This is Agrippa, whom we know of as Agrippa I. Yes, of course, there's going to be an Agrippa II, but we'll come to that at a later stage. He is a member of the Herodian household, who is actually the brother of Herodias, and he lives in Rome and is in the position of being best friend with Drusus, uh, who is the son of Tiberius, the emperor. So how do you behave if you are the friend of the son of the emperor? The answer is not very well at all. You can pretty much do whatever you like, and Agrippa did so. He ran up enormous debts. Uh, Drusus himself, the emperor's son, was known for having a huge amount of arrogance. Uh, Tiberius had a uh, counselor whose name was Sejanus. We'll find out more about Sejanus in just a moment. And uh, Drusus one day decided that Sejanus had acquired too much power, and he expressed himself by hauling off and punching Sejanus right in the face. If you're the son of the emperor, you can get away with that kind of thing. Arrogance in such quarters is not only a modern phenomenon. We see it in antiquity as well. But Drusus died, leaving Agrippa in Rome in debt. And the best thing for him to do is to go away rapidly. So he comes and he joins the household of Antipas and Herodias. And Antipas gives him a job tells him, you can be in charge of the marketplace in Tiberias. You know, congratulations, you can be in charge of this unclean market. Uh, believe it or not, Agrippa thought this somewhat beneath his dignity. They never quite got along, but this provided Antipas with a certain connection with Rome, another link that he could use. The next major event coming from this is 26, when we come to our Pontius Pilate, the prefect of Jerusalem at the time when Jesus was killed. That same time is when Tiberius, the emperor, famously retires from Rome to Capri. He's still in mourning over Drusus, and he leaves the administration of Rome to the same Sejanus whom I just mentioned. Sejanus was a notorious anti-Semite. Wherever he had the possibility of putting someone into power, he would put someone in who would deliberately bait the Jewish population that he was dealing with. He did exactly that in the case of Pontius Pilate and Jerusalem. Pontius Pilate is sent to administer there, and Pilate does something that no previous prefect had done, and that is he has his troops march into Jerusalem in sight of the temple and the Herodian palace there with their shields together with images of the emperor. These are held to be idolatrous in Judaism. You know, it's the very opposite of doing what Antipas had been careful about, not putting images on coins that were idolatrous. Pilate deliberately flouts that. There's a demonstration against what he did. It looks as if he is going to reject that demonstration. And Antipas, together with other Herodians, appealed to the emperor, asked the emperor to overrule Pontius Pilate. The emperor did. Here's another example of Antipas taking the part of Judaism when he could have gone the other way. That's why I say he's an ambivalent character. You can't just see him as a renegade. 
very interesting, complex, ambitious, and yet at some level loyal person. And of course, he and Pontius Pilate are now enemies. They are now opposed to one another. You wonder what could possibly bring them together. You shall see. And indeed, we see very shortly after 26, because already in the year 27, we find Jesus ensconced in another town in Galilee named Capernaum, which you'll see on the map. You can tell it's also a fishing village like uh, Magdala, like Bethsaida. You can still see the remnants of fishing installations in these places. It's really quite fascinating. And there, Jesus becomes known as a rabbi and is openly spoken of as being a rabbi, both by his followers and also, by, interestingly, by his opponents. That is, even people who disagreed with Jesus referred to him as rabbi. Why? Because they knew that he had something to teach about Judaism, whether you like what he taught or not. They understood that he was teaching in regard to the Torah. Antipas knows that Jesus is becoming well known. He also knows that he had been a disciple of John the Baptist. And he also becomes increasingly to know that when Jesus refers to Antipas, it is by way of wisecracks. It is by way of making fun of him. When someone asks him about John the Baptist, Jesus replies, what did you all go out to see when you went to see John the Baptist? Did you go to see someone who was clothed in soft raiment? Oh, no. Those who are in soft raiment, they live in palaces. Who was he thinking of? Antipas. What did you go out to see? Did you go out to see a little reed being pushed around by the wind? Why is he talking about reeds and wind? Because Antipas minted coins with reeds on them. And Jesus makes fun of the skinny little reeds on his coins. Pathetic. Pharisees tell Jesus, Antipas seeks your life in order to kill you. Reflect on that. It's specifically Pharisees who tell Jesus this. Yes, it's true, Jesus and many Pharisees argue with one another over what makes a person pure, what makes for uncleanness. But disputes in that regard are all the way through Judaic literature. Once you think purity is important, how you achieve it will predictably be a matter of dispute. But some of these Pharisees understand that they are arguing with someone who has their basic values in mind. So they warn him. He seeks your life in order to kill you. How does Jesus respond to that? He says, go and tell that fox that I am going to Jerusalem. Now, just as people came to know what was going on in the Herodian court, so the Herodian court came to know what was going on inside important movements in Judaism, including Jesus' movement. How do we know that? Because one of his followers, named Joanna, was married to one of Antipas' officers. So they know both sides what's going on. And Jesus understands that it's time for him to get out of the reign of Antipas. And he does. This is one motivation, as he himself says, for his going to Jerusalem. The attempt to go to Jerusalem to seek a different area, of course, did not in any way lower the temperature. Quite the reverse. 
why was this the case? Because of the relationship now, which is going to develop between Antipas and Pontius Pilate. Because Pilate, in this period, decides that he's going to undertake yet another act against the temple. He wants to build an aqueduct to carry water into the temple. And he believes that if he's going to build this aqueduct, which is the infrastructure of the Romans during this period. If you're a Roman officer, you want to put up an aqueduct. It's like putting up a bridge or a throughway today. He needs money for that. And he actually confiscates money directly from the temple, has his forces go in to take the funding. On this occasion, he decides he is not going to negotiate. He'll react with violence to any kind of pushback. So he orders a meeting in the area of the temple itself, has a podium built for himself as if he's going to discuss with the crowd that comes. In fact, he has no intent to discuss whatsoever. He orders his soldiers, disguised, to enter into the crowd. And at his order, they take clubs out and begin beating the crowd. There's a stampede. Many people died. This event is actually reported to Jesus. In the New Testament, Jesus refers to a group of Galileans, he says, whose blood Pilate mixed with their sacrifices. This is exactly the incident detailed in much, much greater specificity by Josephus that occurred in this period. So actually, it appears that Antipas and Pontius Pilate are further and further apart, and indeed, Pontius Pilate is more and more anti-Semitic. But there's an event that occurs that no one could have forecast. Uh, and this happens, you'll see this on the top of the second page of the chronology. This happens in the year 31. On the 18th of October, Sejanus is actually put to death in Rome. Tiberius, the emperor, finally becomes suspicious of him and permits the enemies of Sejanus to act against him. Those who had been allied with Sejanus are therefore in an extremely vulnerable position. What is Pontius Pilate to do? These are the circumstances that have arisen at the time that Jesus enters into Jerusalem and creates a scene in the temple. Jesus and his followers are in dispute over the question of, guess what, purity. Is it pure to have animals for sale for sacrifice within the complex of the temple? Traditionally, they had been outside the temple. The high priest, Caiaphas, had permitted them to be inside the temple. So there's a very specific reason for what Jesus and his followers do. There is every reason also for Jesus to think that in imposing this, in attempting to shut down the vendors of animals, he will be encountering opposition. But what he can't know is that this opposition will come from, of all people, Pontius Pilate, because he's never taken the side of the high priest before. Why does he now? Answer, Sejanus, his protector, had been put to death. He needs new allies, and he better get them very quickly, 
because many of the friends of Sejanus himself had been put to death at the time that Sejanus was. His family was assassinated as well. This was not, the Romans did not have a regime which was forgiving or gentle. When you were out of power, you were out of life in many cases. So Pilate makes common cause not only with Caiaphas, but also now with Antipas. And this explains why in the Gospel according to Luke, when Pontius Pilate learns that Jesus is from Galilee, he sends him to Antipas to see what Antipas has to say. Antipas clothes him as if he were some kind of king and sends him back to Pontius Pilate as a symbolic way of saying, this is someone who's a threat to Roman hegemony. He is setting himself up as a royal pretender. So Pontius Pilate orders him crucified, and as Luke's gospel says, Antipas and Pontius Pilate became friends from that time. It looked as if he had managed to put this whole thing together. Meanwhile, Antipas also looks better from the point of view of Rome because he has managed to give the prefect a power base that he can work with. Naturally, also, that eliminates this whole issue of Jesus that Herod Antipas did. You see, from front to back, the issue is the purity is understood within Judaism, whether you are John the Baptist or Jesus, or come to that, Antipas. So you might think that, therefore, all might be well with Antipas. Alas, it is not. Alas for him. His ambition is completely undiminished, uh, especially because in the year 34, his brother Philip died. And so he thinks that might be an opportunity for him to extend the realm that he governs under the Romans. But instead, that realm is held in abeyance. And then finally, in the year 36, Pontius Pilate simply goes too far. Uh, in that year, he led Romans into Samaria and destroyed entire villages of Samaritans, putting the populations to death. Ultimately, the Romans thought, even the Romans thought, this is impossible. This is a totally senseless cruelty. <laughs> if we wanted that, we could have left Archelaus in power. This is exactly the kind of behavior they don't want. So now, maybe Antipas can hope no prefect I, perhaps, have fallen on exactly the right time to be named to my father's throne. At last, I'll no longer simply be a governor of Galilee. Maybe I could become king of Judea. But then Tiberius, whose favor he is carefully curried, dies in the year 37. New Emperor Caligula turns out to be an extremely good friend of, of all people, Agrippa. Remember Agrippa? This apparently insignificant nephew? Well, he's back, and he's in imperial favor. I'll speak next time about how he won this favor against the odds. For now, it's only important to know he has the favor. Antipas does not. So Caligula says, my good friend Agrippa, why don't you go to Philip's old area, the Golan? Oh, and by the way, you're not governor. I'm naming you king. Drives Antipas crazy. 
So he goes to Rome, makes a special plea to Caligula, oh, make me king too. Don't even, you don't even have to give me Judea. Just make me king of Galilee. You know, if you're going to make one Herodian king, make another Herodian king. And Caligula says, you're going to Gaul. I'm exiling you. You have no rule. Be happy, I'm not killing you. It's all over. And by an act of cruelty, he offers Herodias the wife. He says, you know, if you want, I'll let you stay. And Herodias, to her credit, says, no. I'm going into exile with Antipas. He and the whole family are a remarkable combination of loyalty and ambition, one constantly finessing the other and bringing back extraordinarily unpredictable results. That pattern of unpredictable result is something that we'll see when we come to discuss what happens to Agrippa when he actually gets to Golan and beyond Golan and his son, Agrippa II. But that we'll leave for next time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. She was married already. Yes. Well, what happens? Yeah, I will repeat the question. What happened to Herodias' husband? multiple, since indeed she was married already. And, and this is a very tawdry tale. So you'll be happy you asked the question. I mentioned that her father, as Aristobulus, had been killed by Herod the Great. But Herod the Great, being Herod the Great, after he did something like that, would then try to be kind to the rest of the family. And so he said, I know you, Herodias, can marry another one of my sons. I know it's incestuous, but the, he thinks this is being kind. This is part of the, I will say, it's the use of incest within Roman practice in order to make dynastic lines, they would argue, more pure. Of course, it's totally vile from the point of view of Judaism, but that's the way they understood it. So I am going to let you, Herodias, marry another one of my sons whose name was, I'm not making this up, Herod II. And in fact, in one of Herod's many wills, this Herod II was designated to inherit. But it turned out that this Herod II was then involved in a plot against Herod the Great. So he's written out of the will, and now he has no prospects. Herodias didn't like men without prospects. And therefore, after her marriage to Herod II, she marries Philip, the same Philip who is governor of Golanitis. So she leaves Philip in order to marry Antipas. So she betrays her husband, Antipas betrays his wife, the princess of Nabatea. No one is going to be happy. And in fact, towards the end of his reign, and this was one of the considerations, I think, that made Tiberius think Antipas was not the man for him. Towards the end of his reign, Antipas actually entered into a war with the Nabataeans, and to some extent it was because Aratus IV, the king, and the father of that wife, wanted to inflict some damage on Antipas. So did the troops of Philip. In the midst of the battle, they turned against Antipas and for the troops of the Nabataeans, showing you that the marriage ploy that was supposed to make him stronger 
in fact resulted in a weakening in the Roman position, which is not what the Romans want. But yes, this intermarriage among Herodians uh, becomes a very strong trait all the way through the first century and is one of the reasons that they are criticized not only by John the Baptist, but also by others within Judaism and for understandable reasons. The ethos of Rome of intermarriage is opposed to the ethos of Judaism. There's a sense in which there's no way of finessing some kind of compromise. I know it's preemptive, but uh, the uh, figure of King Agrippa in the Book of Acts, is this is the same person? Very good. The question comes up. Uh, at very, it's good. It's a teaser for next time. Yeah. We have Agrippa. We have, in fact, in the Book of Acts, two Agrippas. We have... I can't get out of this name problem. It's just given to me by history, you know. We have Agrippa I, whom we've just met, and we'll see more about him, and then his son, Agrippa II, and an absolutely extraordinary figure, Berenike, who is the brother of the same Agrippa II. We'll see them making their way with the Romans uh, in ways which I think are even more astounding than what Antipas and Herodias got up to. But I think we're in good shape now. Thank you very much. There's a, there's a virtual applause going on here. So uh, we do look forward to seeing you, well, not only on Zoom, but maybe not even virtually, maybe next time with Omicron on the retreat, we'll be able to be more in person. We can hope for that. Take care until then.